Hi. In this video, we're going to talk, quickly talk about safety during distillation. What do you need to know so you don't blow yourself up or poison somebody or, or yourself? Now, we've previously mentioned in another video that distillation can be dangerous. And yes, it can be dangerous. Uh, like I just mentioned, you can cause a fire, you can cause an explosion, you can poison yourself or somebody else if you don't know what you are doing. Now, the dangers are sometimes overstated, and uh, it's made to sound a lot worse than it really is. And I'm probably going to do the same thing in this video, but that's done intentionally. It is to scare you so that you respect the process. You need to respect what you are doing when you are distilling and fermenting in order to ensure your own safety and the safety of others. Now, you need to respect your fermentation, your distillation, and your final product, or it can have very detrimental effects to your health, and it can even kill you. Now, the three main safety concerns we worry about is CO2 suffocation, fire and explosion, and poisoning. CO2 suffocation can occur during fermentation, fire and explosion can occur during distillation, and poisoning can occur during fermentation, distillation, or spirit enhancement. Now, let's look at these three safety factors individually. The first one we're going to look at is fermentation or CO2 suffocation. Now, during fermentation, one sugar molecule is broken up into two ethanol molecules and two carbon dioxide molecules. Great. But what the hell does that mean? One kilogram of sugar, when fermenting, will release 250 liters of carbon dioxide gas. Now, that sounds a lot, but it's kind of difficult to visualize because we're talking about gas here. Now, let's say we use a room. 3 meters long by 3 meters wide by 2.5 meters high. 22.5 cubic meters in volume space for 18 square meters. Rooms completely enclosed. Doors closed, window cl uh, windows closed. There's no ventilation happening inside that space. Inside that space, you've got three 20-liter buckets. Right? Three 20-liter buckets busy fermenting. If you leave those free 20 liter buckets through the night, they ferment through the night, releasing carbon dioxide gas, you walk in the next morning, you will drop down and die. The reason for this carbon dioxide is heavier than air, so it fills the room from the bottom up. So the more carbon dioxide goes into or is being released into the room, the more this is filling up and is rising and rising and is rising. And once the carbon dioxide level comes here and you walk in, you're inhaling carbon dioxide gas and you pass out. And now you're lying in concentrated carbon dioxide gas and you will suffocate. Now you might be thinking, geez, but the chances of something like that happening at home is negligible. Is it really that dangerous? It has happened. People have died because of this. In South Africa specifically, there were two people in uh, Cape Town that had a cellar underneath their house. They decided to make their own wine. It was busy fermenting. The one friend went down to check the fermentation. He dropped down. The friend ran down to help him. Dropped down next to him. The bodies were discovered three days later. This is a valid concern. It is something that can be extremely dangerous. So you need to be sure, especially if you're making bigger fermentations or large quantities of fermentations, that there is enough airflow through that area in order to, to limit or to, uh, the amount of CO2 buildup or to make sure that there's no CO2 buildup. Obviously, when you're going commercial, uh, commercial and you're talking 1,000-liter fermentation tanks or even bigger, then you're talking about a lot of CO2 that's being um, released. In cases like that, you, uh, ventilation forms part of your fire inspection. Now, the legal requirement for rate of air exchange in a commercial operation is one and a half times per hour. That means your total air volume needs to be replenished one and a half times every hour through natural ventilation. If, you're, if that natural ventilation is not enough to ensure that um, amount of ventilation, then you will need to put in a ventilation system. Now, this ventilation system cannot be an extractor fan system. An extractor will pull the oxygen up, causing the carbon dioxide to rise faster. You need an intractor fan system blowing air inwards, creating an overpressure, pushing the carbon dioxide down and up through vents on floor level or close to floor level. That is the proper way to ensure ventilation. Now, the dangers or the warning signs that you'll see in when there is too much CO2 or too high CO2 concentration in the air, at 1% concentration, you'll experience drowsiness. At 3% concentration, you'll experience reduced hearing, mild narcosis, um, and increased heart rate and blood pressure. 
at a 5% concentration, you'll experience dizziness, confusion, headaches, and shortness of breath. And at an 8% concentration, you'll experience dim sight, muscle tremors, sweating, and finally unconsciousness. An easy way to remember it, headaches, nausea, dizziness, breathlessness, collapse, loss of consciousness. I know it looks like a good Friday night out, but it's actually quite dangerous. And especially from nausea to loss of consciousness, it goes very fast. So if you're experiencing headaches and nausea in the area where you are fermenting or in the area where you're busy, get out. Get some fresh air into you, get fresh air into that area, but do not take chances. This can be extremely dangerous if you're working with large volumes of fermentation. Next uh, uh, danger that we need to talk about or safety concern that we need to talk about is fire and explosion. Now, distilling alcohol is the same as boiling petrol. If I were to give you a 5-litre bucket of 93 unleaded petrol and I told you put it on a gas burner and bring it to a boil, either you would refuse to do it and leave or you would be extremely careful if you had that level of trust in my advice to, uh, um, to when you are doing it. You need to have that same level of respect when you are distilling. Now, the reason why you need to be so careful is the flashpoint temperature of alcohol. 45% ABV ethanol, that's 90 proof ethanol. Uh, that's about 2% more than a South African minimum standard for uh, potable alcohol sold, brandy, whiskey, and vodka. They're all sold at 43%, 86 proof, so very close to that level. At 45% ABV, your flashpoint temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. That means at room temperature, if I were to put a flame in contact with that alcohol, it will ignite and burn. It will catch a light. 95% alcohol, 190 proof, almost pure alcohol, has a flashpoint temperature of only 13 degrees Celsius. So the higher the proof, the higher the percentage ABV, the greater the purity of the alcohol, the easier it will ignite and burn. Now, during distillation, that is what we are doing. We are purifying the alcohol. We are increasing the ABV percentage or the proof, means, means at the same time, we're reducing its flashpoint temperature, making it easier to ignite and burn. But to make matters worse, if we look at a still, from the top of the boiler, the section over here above the liquid level, through the vapor chamber, through the swan's neck, to the condenser, what we call the vapor path. We're dealing with purified alcoholic vapors. Vapors don't burn. Vapors explode. So if there's a leak anywhere on your still and these vapors leak out in a confined space with, for lack of ventilation, and then somewhere there's an ignition source, somebody walking in with a cigarette, or striking a lighter, whatever the case may be, that can and will lead to an explosion if the vapor buildup was big enough. So you need to be sure that there are no leaks on your stall for your own safety. The other thing we have to worry about or be aware of is the storage of high purity alcohol. The higher the purity of the alcohol, the obviously easier it will catch uh, a light, but the more difficult it becomes to detect a fire of high purity alcohol. Now you might have seen this before, and there's a lot on the internet uh, and social media about uh, estimating the proof or the purity of alcohol based on the colors of flames. So if it's a low purity flame, it's a yellow or orange flame. High purity, it's a blue flame. Very high purity, there's sometimes no visible flame. You can see heat rising up, but you can't actually see the flame. And even at a blue flame level, there's no real smoke because there's nothing to form smoke as the alcohol is burning. This makes a smoke detector useless. That's why any fire inspector on a commercial operation that uh, knows what he's doing will insist on both a heat detector as well as a smoke detector because the heat detector will pick up a high purity alcohol fire before the smoke detector does. If there's a high purity alcohol fire and there's already smoke, that means other stuff is burning already. It's not necessarily um, just the alcohol that's burning, something else is burning already and that means it might be too late. This is also where the bund wall comes in. Now, the bund wall is a retaining wall surrounding your spirit holding tanks. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about a bund wall. A lot of people have told me, no, but it has to be a standard of one meter high or something like that. That's nonsense. There is no fixed height for a bund wall. The height of the wall has got nothing to do with it. 
the wall surrounding your spirit holding tanks. If you take the height of that wall times the width of the wall times the length of that wall, that answer of that calculation, that volume retained by the wall has to be equal to or greater than the largest holding tank within that area. The thinking is that if the chances of more than one tank failing at the same time and spilling out all its contents is negligible. But if the largest of the tanks in the spirit holding area were to fail or were to leak and all the alcohol leaks out, that bund wall needs to be able to retain that liquid within that space, stopping it from running all over the distillery floor where it could possibly ignite and start a fire, or if it's already burning, spreading the fire throughout the distillery. That is the goal of the bund wall. Now, when it comes to South African law and fire inspections, what you have to keep in mind, and we cover this in articles on our website regarding um, applications for commercial distilling licenses and so forth as well, we touch on this. You have to be aware that we're dealing with national laws, provincial laws, and municipal laws. They all play roles in different facets. Now, when it comes to the fire inspections, this falls under municipal regulations. And it does differ sometimes, not always, but sometimes it differs, maybe not in terms of the way it's written, but the way it's enforced between different municipalities and between different inspectors. So it is, it has happened that in some municipalities they say that the boon wall is not a legal requirement. They say if you have a sloped floor with a floor drain, you don't need the boon wall. Now, the reasoning behind that is if the tank were to leak, the alcohol would flow out into the flow drain, uh, flow, floor drain and be taken away. Personally, I don't agree with that at all. Because if there's an ignition source between the tank and the floor drain, there's still a possibility that you could ignite the fire and still spread the fire. So I always recommend putting in a bun wall, but it's not necessarily a legal requirement in your specific municipality. You will need to make that decision for yourself. Now, some common sense rules when you're distilling to avoid fire and explosion. Firstly, do not smoke while distilling. Kind of obvious. So you don't want an ignition source uh, close to something that's uh, giving out all alcohol or they, where there might be a leak. Do not use an open flame if it can be avoided. Gas is the easiest way and the best way to distill on small scale because it gives you more fine control than electricity. But it is dangerous. Now, if you're using a proper, cons properly constructed still that has no leaks, you are limiting the risk, but it is still a risk. You need to respect the fact that you've got an open flame very close to or near to high purity alcohol that can ignite and burn. So if at all possible, you need to put some kind of shield or something in between there so that if something goes wrong, if you're not paying attention or whatever you're capturing, the distillate in overflows, that you're not creating a situation that could lead to a fire or to an explosion. You need to ensure excellent ventilation wherever you are distilling. If you can distill outside, if that's at all feasible as a home distiller, then you should do that. Uh, but... There's problems with drafts and so forth, and obviously for a commercial level, that's not doable. But there must be enough ventilation that when you are distilling, if there is an undetected leak, that there is not a vapor buildup in the area where you are um, busy distilling. Avoid using glass containers. Now, a lot of people, uh, especially on social media, keep on saying, no, but you have to use uh, glass, you should not use plastic. Um, and they talk about leaching of chemicals from the plastic and so on. This is... Completely blown out of proportion and exaggerated. Standard plastic used in distilling. If you're buying from a reputable supplier, that plastic will be chemical resistant and alcohol resistant plastic. There is absolutely no danger of any chemicals or anything leaching from a chemical resistant or alcohol resistant plastic. It is fine to use them. The reason why we do not advocate the use of glass containers for capturing distillate and for you to use for measurements and so forth is the possibility of breakage, which could lead to spillage, which could lead to fire. If you're going commercial, if you have any knowledge at all of HACCP, you would know in any case that you're not allowed to use glass containers to be HACCP compliant. Um, the reason for that is the possibility of contamination and cross-contamination and the uh, glass ending up in final products and final beverages and so forth. Um, if the acid guys had their way, we wouldn't even be allowed to use glass alcohol meters and uh, hydrometers inside the fermentations. So avoid using glass containers. It could lead to breakage and spillage, which could, which could lead to a fire. 
Never decant or fill near a heat source. Now, basically, when you are distilling, and this, you will understand this a lot more once you've done uh, one of our training videos regarding fractional distillation specifically, and just in general, when you see the way we teach people how to distill, making cuts, taking off different fractions, and so forth, there's quite a bit of capturing and pouring over from one container to another. Now, the idea here is that you should not do it close to the heat source, because sometimes you spill. Let's face it, we're all human, and you can spill a bit of alcohol. If that spilt alcohol then catches fire, then obviously we've got a problem. So if you are pouring from one container to another, do that away from the heat source. Obviously, this now applies to exposed flames and not necessarily a electric spiral or plate. That's got more limited risk. Never leave your still unattended. That's a very important one. Distillation takes time. If you were to use a 5-liter still like this, and you were doing a proper distillation, proper fractional, slow distillation, the right way, then, you will, uh, then you're looking at a good three to four hours of distilling that you will need to do in order to get that distillation done properly. It takes time, right? If you can't sit there for that four to five hours, then you shouldn't do it. Even if you're doing a vodka distillation with a 10-plate fractioning column or a 12-plate fractioning column, you're looking at a good 7 to 9 hours if you're going for maximum recovery rate. If you can't sit there for that period of time, then don't do it. Obviously, I'm referring now to distilling of fermentation, not distilling of low wines, which would be faster. But regardless, it takes time. You cannot start up a still and go take a nap or go drop the kids off at school or go shopping or do anything else. Somebody responsible needs to be at the still at all times. Things go wrong. Personally, my still is at my house. I live on a small holding, or a plot, depending on what you want to call it. So we're dealing with boil water, pressure tank, and gravity tank. If something goes wrong, for instance, with the pressure pump, that means there's no water circulating through the condenser of my still. I'm still inputting heat. The water's not circulating. Suddenly... There's no more conden uh, condensing happening in the spirit condenser, and I'm blowing out va uh, alcohol vapors out of my still, which will obviously lead to an explosion inside my house. You cannot leave the still alone. Things go wrong. So at all times, somebody responsible, somebody that knows, at least knows how to turn the still off, needs to be at the still to, if something goes wrong, that they know what to do. Keep the distillate receiver away from the heat source. Now, this distillate receiver would be whatever you are capturing the distillate in. So, ideally, the outflow from your condenser should point as far away as possible from the heat source. Again, more relevant if it's an open flame than anything else. But if something were to go wrong there, either spillage or something goes wrong with the condenser <laughs> and suddenly you're spewing out alcoholic vapors instead of distillate out of your still, that it's not uh, coming out close to or into the actual flames that's heating up your still. Never store uncut alcohol unless it's in the fridge. Now, uncut alcohol is high proof, high percentage ABV, undiluted spirit. This would be the distillate coming out of your still prior to you adding water to dilute it down to drinking level. Anything from 60% upwards would be see, uh, seen as uncut alcohol. That would be 120 proof and upwards. Now, if you are storing this for other purposes. Maybe you want to redistill it again to get it to even higher purity, or you want to use it to infuse uh, gin or something like that. The best place to store that un uh, uncut alcohol is in the fridge. Now, this obviously only applies to home and hobby distillers. It's not feasible for a commercial craft distiller to do this. But for the home and hobby distiller, it makes absolute sense. Firstly, you are taking the alcohol away from its flashpoint temperature by cooling it down. So the chances of it burning or igniting is reduced. Secondly, you are limiting the amount of evaporation that takes place because the alcohol is uh, cold. Because the higher the proof, the higher the purity, the higher the percentage ABV, the lower the evaporation temperatures, the more you're going to lose during the storage process. So by cooling the alcohol down, you're reducing your losses. Just make sure it's properly sealed and properly marked. The last thing you want is your kids running around with 90% alcohol, because obviously that is never a good idea. Fine. Um, be sure that all fittings are tight and there's no leaks on your stall. And self-explanatory, make sure that everything on your still is sealed and uh, connected correctly and sealed tightly so that no vapors can leak out to begin with. 
And then lastly, have firefighting equipment on hand. Now, at home, this can be a normal car or household fire extinguisher. In a previous video, we already explained to you how to make your own little CO2 fire extinguisher at home using bicarbonate of soda and water solution with a towel. But you must have some form of fighting a fire if something were to go wrong. Commercially, of course, you need the whole setup. You need multiple types of fire extinguishers, fire hose reels, fire blankets, first aid kit, emergency lighting, fire escape signage, assembly areas. All of this is required in a commercial setup. That's why your most important um, inspection will be your fire inspections. This is your basic safety rules when you're looking to uh, prevent fire and explosion inside a distillery. The next thing we'd have to look at is poisoning. Now, as I said, poisoning can happen during fermentation, distillation, or spirit enhancement. Now, the first type of poisoning we're going to talk about is methanol poisoning. Now, let me just make it clear from the beginning. Methanol poisoning and the dangers of methanol poisoning is a very divisive topic, especially on social media and if you look at these uh, home distilling group and moonshining groups and so on. There are valid arguments both sides. Long and short of it, methanol is dangerous. It, is extreme, it can be extremely dangerous. 10 milliliters of methanol consumed in one hour, you've got a 95% chance of going blind. 100 mils of methanol consumed uh, in one hour, you've got a 95% uh, chance of dying. You won't see yourself dying because you'll definitely be blind by that time. And there's not a blindness you can recover from. What the methanol actually does, it strips the protective covering of the, ne of the neurons in the eye, and you're blind for life. And... Um, as we all know, neurons can't be replaced or repaired. There's no surgery. There's no transplant that can be done. If you're blind, you're blind for life. And keeping one eye closed while drinking will not preserve the eyesight in one eye. Some people have very weird theories about these things. Now, a lot of this uh, negativity or dangers or warnings about methanol comes from tradition to a certain extent, also uh, very much referring back to the times of prohibition when uh, uh, rum runners and uh, bootleggers and so on would take in alcohol, then water it down to increase the volume and adding methanol in there then to give it a bit more bite so that people wouldn't realize what they were buying uh, actually um, was watered down. And this led to people dying from ethanol poisoning. So that's the, the history behind it. The fact, however, is that methanol still plays a very big role in liquor legislation. There are very, very strict guidelines as to the amount of methanol alcohol is allowed um, uh, to contain. And it's still legislated, it's still regulated, it's one of the tests that alcohol must go through, it must go through a methanol test uh, before it's allowed to be sold. And the levels are very, very low. You need to um, be sure that you've got almost no methanol in your uh, alcohol, otherwise you're not allowed to sell it. Why I say it's sometimes exaggerated is that there's this idea uh, floating around that you can distill all methanol out. Um, it's a variation of what we refer to as the magic boiling temperature myth, where people believe that you reach a certain temperature and suddenly all the compounds that boil at that temperature, just poof, it evaporates. So you get to 55 uh, degrees Celsius and poof, there goes the acetone. You get to 67, uh, and poof, there goes the methanol and so forth. Now that's absolute nonsense. In future videos, um, when we do our training videos about training for distillation, we're going to discuss this in depth and we're going to explain about how boiling temperature is affected by what different factors it's affected and how boiling temperatures and so forth actually works. But a lot of people believe this, that you can distill out all the methanol in the heads or the foreshots. Now, that, this is not possible. Okay? There is an article doing the rounds on social media um, that keeps on being shared over and over and over again to ad nauseum um, that explains it in depth, but it basically comes down to affinities. And affinities applies to uh, water and alcohol as well, but you also get water and methanol affinities. And what happens is that when there's a lot, high concentration of a certain type of molecule, let's say in this case now methanol, when you've got a lot of methanol, the methanol makes bonds with one another. Uh, because there's a lot of uh, methanol, and they make these bonds with the, between the different methanol um, uh, molecules. But a stronger bond is formed between methanol and water. Now, while there is still a lot of methanol, like seeks like, so the methanol congregates together. But once we've removed a lot of these methanol molecules and there's more water in between the methanol, now there's more of these stronger 
water methanol bonds that's being formed. And the water actually holds this methanol back. So there is truth to the fact that you can distill methanol out in your heads. And you can concentrate it in your heads, especially if you're using a fractionating um, still where you do still stabilization, where you concentrate all the heads at the top of the column prior to drawing it off. There is truth to that. If you're using your uh, an limbic still, if you're distilling very slowly and carefully, yes, you can concentrate the majority of the methanol in the heads, but you cannot take out all the heads. There's even some research that shows that um, there's more methanol in the tails than there is in the heads. Now, I'm not really sure of the, uh, of the validity of that research. We're still doing our own investigations to prove or disprove those theories um, because it wasn't done in very specific situations with fruit-based spirits, so it's not necessarily applicable to everything. The argument can be made that volume-wise there's more in the tails, but not concentration-wise. And concentration is the dangerous thing. I mean, there's methanol in wine, as well, there's methanol and beers, but because it's not at a high enough concentration, it doesn't really become dangerous. But long story short, yes, we can distill out most of the methanol, but not all of the methanol. In the end, it comes down to the following, that even if there were methanol inside your alcohol, it's not really dangerous. In a, f uh, a future video, we're going to talk about responsible alcohol use. Um, and we're going to explain a bit more in depth what actually happens during alcohol poisoning and the treatment for that and so forth. But one of the things that we will touch on in that as well is the treatment for methanol poisoning. Now, the treatment for methanol poisoning, and this is why this little poster is here on the slide, that's actually a poster that was um, used in America to warn people about the dangers of homemade spirits, specifically the dangers of methanol poisoning. And the reason I'll include it in the slide is that the treatment for methanol poisoning is to consume high purity alcohol. So if you've now taken off the heads out of your run and you accidentally take a sip of the wrong, uh, from the wrong glass or the wrong uh, tot that you were taking off and you now have consumed a pure shot of pure heads which has a high concentration of methanol, you stand a chance of developing methanol poisoning, but you don't have to panic. All you need to do is go to your liquor cabinet, take whatever you have available there, vodka, brandy, whiskey, whatever, pour yourself a nice big glass and down that. And then have somebody take you to the doctor or, um, well, preferably don't drive yourself because you don't want to get arrested for drunk driving just because you're trying to save your own eyesight. Now, the reason for this, why this treatment works, we'll discuss in a future video, but that is the treatment for methanol poisoning, is the consumption of alcohol. Now, Considering that you might end up with some methanol in the distillate you've produced during the distillation process, if you now consume that, you're consuming alcohol along with the methanol, so the alcohol will counteract the methanol and you limit the chance of uh, developing methanol poisoning by drinking your homemade alcohol. So it is something to respect, it is something to be aware of, but Yes, normally the chances of methanol poisoning is blown out of proportion and is not as big of a worry that, uh, as people make it out to be. There are other compounds in the heads that is more poisonous than methanol. And also the main reason, of course, is most of the compounds in the heads doesn't taste good. That's why we don't want it in our final product. It's not as much about poisoning as it is about quality of product. The next type of poisoning happens during distillation, and this is lead poisoning. Now, lead poisoning occurs when people build their own stills or make repairs to stills and they don't know what they're doing. Now, alcohol is solvent. We know this. That's why we use alcohol in dyes and inks and perfumes and essential oils and so forth, because alcohol is solvent. And the higher the purity of the alcohol, the more solvent the alcohol becomes. Now, if we look at a still, for instance, one of these Olympic stills, there are several points on the still where there is soldering. And it's very difficult to build a still yourself if you don't solder um, or weld, at least on the still. Now, let's say you built a still and you used a lead-based solder or you used lead anywhere on that still. Lead is a very soft metal. It dissolves easily. Now you've got high-purity alcohol, therefore very solvent alcohol, passing through or over or past this lead. Some of that lead will be dissolved by the alcohol, vapor, be that the alcohol liquid or the alcohol vapors, and carried into the final distillate. If you then consume enough of this distillate, you will end up dying from lead poisoning, which is not a very nice way to die, because first you go crazy and then you die. 
So you cannot use any lead-based solder or lead in still construction. Any still that we did not build ourselves, that we are asked to serialize on behalf of any uh, of a client, the first thing we do is a lead test. If the still tests positive for lead, we will not serialize that still because that still is then not safe to use. And if our serial number is on that still, we are liable for what happens when somebody uses that still. So no still can contain any lead. You cannot use it if the still contains lead, long and short of it. The only safe solders to use is um, 97 free solder, also referred to as plumber's solder, which is 97% tin, 3% copper, um, silver, or copper brazing, or silver solder. Those are your free safe solders to use. The other material to avoid in steel construction is aluminium. Now, it's got nothing to do with lead. Some people think that we always say you can't use aluminium because of it's got something to do with lead. That's not the case. Aluminium has nothing to do with lead. However, it does happen that people use aluminium pots, for instance, an aluminium pressure cooker, in order to build a homemade still. They use that aluminium pot then as a boiler. Now, the problem with aluminium is if you take aluminium and you add heat to that boiler, which is what you do in a boiler. You are adding heat in the boiler. So now you're adding heat to the aluminium, and you combine that with acidity, low pH. And all fermentations, especially fruit fermentations, are acidic. So sugar washes can be very acidic. pH of 2 to 3 is not uncommon in a sugar uh, wash or sugar fermentation. So if you buy, uh, combine acidity, heat, and aluminium, that gives you aluminium oxide. Aluminium oxide will also then evaporate um, with, the, with the alcohol vapors carrying to the final distillate, and if you drink enough of that distillate, you will end up dying from heavy metal poisoning, which does happen over a very long period of time, kind of with, as with lead poisoning as well. It builds up over time. The warning side of heavy metal poisoning being the little white lines you see on your nails. That's an indication of metal buildup uh, in your body. But if you, um, if you want to build a still, avoid lead and avoid aluminium if at all possible. The last type of poisoning is poisoning during spirit enhancement, also known as poisoning through stupidity. Um, I basically refer to it as Darwinism at work. People add weird stuff into the uh, fermentations and into the final products. In South Africa, we've got a problem with home brews like Unkumbuti and Skokian and so forth, where people add in battery acid, antifreeze and batteries into the products to give it more kick or for whatever reasons. Uh, the thinking being that batteries gives you power, so your drink's going to give you more power. I blame that battery energy drink for that misconception. Um, and antifreeze stops your car from freezing in the winter, so it's going to keep you warm in the winter. All, of course, very, very dangerous and very, very st stupid. Anybody who's ever watched an episode of CSI will know that antifreeze is the poison most commonly used by wives to kill their husbands because it's sweet and cannot be detected. So why on earth would you put it in something that you're going to be drinking? But it happens, believe it or not. So uh, the tabloids in South Africa, we have a, for those of you that's not from South Africa, we've got a newspaper called The Sun, um, very similar to The Sun in the UK as well. And very often, about once a week, there'll be an article about somebody that died because one of these concoctions. And that is the legal terminology. It's called a concoction. Um, they, it's so common, they actually has, have legislation about this. Um, in the Western Cape, for instance, if you're applying for a liquor license, you have to get a letter from the Department of Agriculture stating that the product you're producing is not a concoction. That's how commonly this actually happens. In Europe, we find wormwood used to make absinthe. Now, absinthe has three main compounds. For those of you unfamiliar with absinthe, you can basically compare it to a gin. It's a flavored spirit and made in basically the same way as either vapor infusion, direct infusion, or indirect infusion. It just doesn't contain juniper. If it were to contain juniper, then it would be a gin. So an absinthe can be seen as a gin, where instead of juniper, it must contain three main compounds. Wormwood, aniseed, and fennel. Aniseed and fennel giving the licorice flavor profile of the absinthe. And wormwood is kind of this mythological herb. There's a lot of uh, connotations and stories and so on attached to wormwood, but it's a traditional part of absinthe. Now, the story goes that because of a chemical compound called uh, fujone, sp it's spelled to jeune, but you pronounce it fujone, because of fujone found in uh, wormwood, if you drink absinthe, you're going to loosen it. The 
the argument is that fusion is hallucinogen. Now, this is absolute nonsense. The concentration of fusion found in absinthe is nowhere near enough to ma uh, make you hallucinate. And to be, uh, to be completely honest, the whether or not fusion is actually a hallucinogen or not seems to be unclear. There's research either way that neither proves nor disproves whether or not it really is a hallucinogen. But the fact of the matter is that absinthe cannot make you hallucinate. There is no way. That story was actually part of a propaganda campaign brought up by the French wine industry in the late 1800s. In the 1880s, 1890s, the French wine industry was recovering from the blight which destroyed their vineyards. That same blight actually led to the growth and popularity of um, Scottish whiskey. Because up to that point, people in the UK were not drinking whiskey, they were drinking cognac. It was with the poor people that were drinking whiskey or ushki or their versions of moonshine, poitin, and so forth. That was for the poorer classes. The wealthier uh, or well-to-do individuals, they drank cognac. But suddenly cognac wasn't available because there was no wine to make cognac because of the blight in France. So some enterprising Scotsmen started using cognac barrels to age the, um, or impart flavor and color to the, the up to then clear whiskey or whiskey, and hence modern day whiskey was born. So the British market moved towards the consumption of their locally produced whiskey. So when France recovered from the blight, suddenly they could make cognac again, but they'd lost the cognac market or it had been greatly reduced. The local wine market had also been lost because there was so little wine available in this period that they had this pest that uh, the local, the poorer consumers could not afford to buy wine. It was only the very wealthy that could afford to buy and consume wine. So the poorer consumers moved towards drinking absinthe. Uh, and now they didn't want to go back because absinthe gave more bang for its buck. It was a higher percentage alcohol, so it got the job done for cheaper and quicker. So people didn't want to go back to drinking wine. So the wine industry needed a way to discredit absinthe, to get people to come back to drinking wine. And they did this through a propaganda campaign. They had leaflets uh, distributed, they had posts put up, newspaper articles, pamphlets, books, all kinds of ways to communicate to people that if you drink absinthe because of the fusion, you're going to hallucinate. And because when you hallucinate, you're going to go crazy. And when you go crazy, you're going to kill your wife and kill your kids and kill your neighbors. And we're going to arrest you and we're going to lobotomize you. So don't drink uh, absinthe. You're going to go crazy. And there was all kinds of stories that were blown out of proportion. There's one very well-known story about a gentleman who actually did just that. He killed his wife and killed his um, neighbors and killed his kids, and everybody blamed absinthe because he'd been drinking absinthe. What they forget to mention is that he'd been drinking continuously for five days, mostly wine and vodka and all kinds of other products, but there happened to be one bottle of absinthe in that multitude of alcohol he'd been consuming over the five days, and absinthe got blamed for his killing spree that he went on. So the story was spread and people believed it. And they believed it right up until 2010. From 2010, for the first time, did a scientist actually go and test the fusion levels in absinthe and realized it had no hallucinogenic properties whatsoever. So we only mention fusion here for historic reasons and to clarify some of the misconceptions. In Moldova, however, they use salamander slime type of salamander that secretes a poisonous slime that, to scare away predators. So what they do is they take this poor little salamander and they eat them like they with a little In Moldova, they use salamander slime, a type of salamander that when threatened secretes a poisonous slime to scare away predators. Now what they do is they take this poor little salamander and they beat him lightly with a little stick and he starts to stress. And because he stresses, he secretes the slime. They then scrape that slime off and they throw that into the fermentation. When they then distill that fermentation, a small amount of this toxin ends up in the final product. Now, they do hallucinate. They do get high while they get drunk. That's not an old wife's tale. That toxin actually does lead to hallucinations. Now, the main thing that you need to remember here is do not add anything to your fermentation or your final product unless you know it's safe. And you must know it's safe. In South Africa, when the whole craft gin craze started, the big thing at that point was Feinbos gin, Feinbos infused uh, gin. And everybody wanted to jump on this bandwagon, not realizing that a very large percentage of Feinbos is actually poisonous. You can't go randomly pick a plant and just infuse that into your product without knowing it's safe. And you must know it's safe. 
can't come to us and say, no, but you Googled it or you Wikipedia it. How do you even know you've got the right cultivar that you're dealing with? You need to speak to an expert. You need to speak to a botanist to find out whether the plant you're using or intend to use is safe to use. And not just the plant, the plant but the part of the plant you're looking at. I've got two books at home, Medicinal Plants of South Africa and Poisonous Plants of South Africa. And more often than not, you would find that the same plant is in both books, where the leaf is medicinal and the bark is poisonous, or the bark is medicinal and the root is poisonous. It depends on what part of that plant do you intend to use in your final product, whether that would be safe to use or not. So speak to an expert to advise you whether or not these products are safe to use. If you speak to the right experts, you can get additional information as well in terms of foraging, flavor comp uh, compositions, flavor contributions and so on and so forth. And lastly, additives afterwards can also be dangerous. Putting in snakes, scorpions, spiders, um, you might not see this very clearly on the video, but this is a baby, uh, a baby cobra with a scorpion in its mouth, uh, the tequila worm and so forth. Adding things in like this happens uh, in some countries, especially in the Far East. Um, it is dangerous. It can be dangerous, especially if you've got something poisonous or venomous inside uh, the, the spirit over time because of the solvency of alcohol that alcohol might eat through the venom sac or poison sac. The venom or poison might leach out into the final product. And then if you drink enough of that final product, you can end up dying or uh, uh, getting very, very sick because of consumption of this poison. But why you would want to do something like that no, I don't really understand in any case. And just for the record, there is no such thing as a tequila worm. You find the worm in some brands of mezcal, but never inside tequila. They're not allowed to put the worm inside tequila, so there's only certain brands of mezcal which may contain a worm. hope that answers all your questions in regards to safety during distillation. Be safe and keep on distilling.